Welcome to Passages. I'm your host, Michael Kegel. Abraham and Sarah, arguably, have the first serious relationship in the Torah. There are relationships before theirs, but theirs has a certain weight, a certain gravity that is unparalleled with anything that comes before it. Is this gravity a sign of love? Is it love? Is that what love is? The seriousness? Please join me as we explore this question with my two guests, Professor Robert Gibbs from the University of Toronto and Rachel Turkinich, the director of the Toronto Heschel School. The question was that of love, the love between Abraham and Sarah. The word, of course, never appears. The word love doesn't appear in their relationship. It appears only in uh, describing Abraham's feelings towards his son. Feelings, whatever, maybe love is not a feeling. But is there or is there not love between Abraham and Sarah? I just I picture them as very s serious, straight-faced people so for some reason. I, I think they laugh, of course. <laughs> More than but, once? I mean, they certainly, they both, they each have a turn of they, laughing they, once. They do laugh, but I don't think they love each other. Um, you don't even think they love each I other? I don't think they love really? each other, no. I don't think that's the, I don't think they are, and I think that the, the clear sign of that is that Isaac and Rebecca, Isaac really loves Rebecca, mm -hmm. um, and Jacob loves Rachel. But given that those statements are made, I think it's very striking that there is nothing comparable of said of Abraham and Sarah at any point. And I think in many ways, his, it, the relationship is not structured around what we would call you know, anything like romantic love or even the normal conjugal love. Really? When you, when you ask the question of do they love each other, is there love in the relationship, um, even in speaking of Isaac and Rebecca, or later Jacob and Rachel, you can't even compare. It, the, the text says that they love each other, but their relationships are so different. Um, Isaac and Rebecca have a very chemical relationship between them. The love is almost ignited between them on a physical level. Uh, Jacob and Rachel are, are, all, are kindred souls. They're the flip <laughs> sides of the same coin, these two. Um, and with Avram and Sarah, what you see is, is almost how I picture our grandparents or our great-grandparents, <laughs> you know, in the shtetl where there was an arranged marriage and it really wasn't asked if you love the other person, but 20 years later, lo and behold, you're, they're, they're part of you. you. You can't exist without them. Um, th there's love on that level as well. And I, to me, that's what Avram and Sarah are. So it's maybe the question is, what is love? Yes, or I think also, I think more focusedly is to say that the text is giving us three generations of three different relationships, all of them uniquely different, telling you here is the myriad of love. Here is, here is all of the various nuances it can take, and they're all legitimate and they all work, more or less. Well, I, <laughs> no, they all don't work, more, <laughs> more and less, more than less. But I, I actually would, I really... Um, I'm not so sure about the kind of relationship they have and their familiarity. And uh, the, what got me thinking about this the most was that when Sarah dies, Abraham isn't there. And um, it seems to me really quite shocking. Now, of course, there are different explanations. One is that he's just been up on the mountain ready to sacrifice Isaac. Other is that he's uh, away uh, mourning for his brother. But the truth is that at least uh, in the case of the morning, she could have gone too. Um, this, they, they're living apart when she dies. And um, they are together in, the, in a grave after he dies. But I have a feeling of the two of them as living apart even when they were living together in a very strong sense that they so really what, were separated. What then held them together, if not love? Honor? Mutual, well, mutual honor. I mean, in a, in a Jewish uh, marriage contract, there's no mention of love, of course. It doesn't say that either partner is obliged to, bl to love the other, but it does say <laughs> that they're obliged to honor the other. Is that what we have here in this? Well, I wish, I wish there was honor, even. Um, well, I, I think there's honor. There is honor in yeah. times, but there's also betrayal twice with Sarah, both to Pharaoh and to Avi Mela. But I think that I mean, those two are Sarah's different. They're, they're, they, they seem like <coughs> parallel incidents with, with Pharaoh and with Avimelech, but they're not. I see the second one as a betrayal, but in the first one I don't, because in the first one the text is telling you twice he asks her. He says, please, could right. we do it this way? He's leaving her the choice and he's letting her make that decision. The second time it's assumed. He's okay, not let's get, get a clear what we're talking about here. On two occasions, uh, Abraham 
and Sarah find themselves going into a strange land. And Abraham says, I, you're a very beautiful woman, and I'm worried about it. Uh, if they, tell them, th tell tell them, them you're, you're my sister. Tell them my sister, or else they'll kill me. Or else they'll kill me. That's so right. that my soul will live, I want you to lie. So where's mm -hmm. the betrayal? Well, who's, who's betraying whom here? Well, I, th I think that he's, I think in some ways he's betraying their marriage by asking her to pretend to be his sister. But if, if she doesn't, they'll both be killed. Or, well, not both be killed. He will be killed, but the marriage will be dissolved, and therefore their destiny will be dissolved. That's what he says. I see, but you don't think... Uh, I, I think it's, you don't it's very give, dubious. Give. I mean, it seems to me that it's a very high price to pay. What should he have done? I, I think it, it, it's a hard question in terms of what should he have done, because I think the text is telling you that probably what he should have done was trust God. Not five or six verses before, God said, those who bless you I will bless, those who curse you I will curse. So he shouldn't have been worried that they would find Sarah attractive and kill him. He should have trusted that God would protect him. But I think that's the underlying issue here, is that Avram has serious trust issues. And that's the whole journey that Avram needs to take in the covenant, is to begin to learn to trust. And so when... You I mean, you're seeing this as a betrayal of their marriage, and I don't even think he sees their marriage in this scenario. I think that to him, the trust is so difficult to come to. He doesn't trust God. He doesn't trust that Paro won't kill him in order to take... I mean, look at the logic of that. Right. I won't take another man's wife because that's adultery, so I'll commit murder in order to free up the woman so I won't do an immoral thing. I, even the logic of it is convoluted. Right. But he doesn't trust that Paro won't do it. And when the same thing happens again with Avimelech, and again he is trusting and he's not trusting Sarah because he's not asking her he's worried she might say no this time having been through it once right. so he's just taking control of it because of his, his mistrust issues and then says I was worried after the whole thing comes out and he's asked why did you do this he says I was worried that you were not God-fearing but the fact is the text told us Avimelech is God-fearing so maybe we can d develop this theme of uh, whether Abraham trusts whether he trusts his wife can you develop it in the context of this e event where she uh, gives him Hagar, and then has, they have to kick out Hagar, and she, then she accuses him. She says, my injustice is, is, my injustice is upon you. Let the Lord judge between me and you. Yes, I, I think that's very important. I think what, what you have is, um, first of all, just to, to get a bit of a context, that here Avram has been promised several times that he'll have a child and there will be a covenant with this child. Meanwhile, he and Sarah are unable to produce a child of their own. And Sarah, through desperation, um, offers Avram her handmaid, Hagar, and says, here, have a child with Hagar and I will build through her. And then Hagar becomes pregnant and treats Sarah lightly, the text says. Sarah gets very angry, begins to abuse Hagar, and then turns to Avram and says, uh, my anger is upon you. This is your fault, and God will judge between. Why does she think it's his fault? It's, it's an interesting question. I think that, first of all, you have the psychological element here, where you have a couple that's been together for years and years, and um, she's feeling that he should know her. It's, it's analogous to, to sitting at home and, and, and there's so much laundry to be done and you turn around to your mate and you say to them quite sincerely, no, please, honey, do go out to the movie with your friends. I have no problem. I'll stay and do the laundry. <laughs> and, and then, of course, when they go, you're furious. They come home and you're just, you're seething with it. And, and you have that argument where they'll say, but I did what you told me to do. And your answer will be, how could you think I meant that? <laughs> you know, you, <laughs> you should have known, known exactly. You, know, you, you know, should have you known should me know better. Right. Should have known me better. And I think that's does she part have trust of it. issues? You say Abraham has trust issues. Does she? Well, does Sarah? Sarah, Sarah has Sarah has other problems, right? <laughs> I mean, the, I I I think the the interesting the example here is so clear. She is looking for the kind of relationship which is never going to be Abraham's to provide. Right? What, what do you mean? Well, she. I think sh she she is expecting more relationship, more emotion, more connection. And she has it with Isaac, I think, mm -hmm. in a way that she never had it with Abraham. So they have, there's a, she's very protective of Isaac, but she's also very connected to Isaac, and Isaac to her. And Isaac satisfies in some ways, and this is, this is, the, tra this is the family tragedy, right, with, with, the, with the binding of Isaac. But th their relationship which is not detailed at all, but one, one gets a feeling for it, especially from the fact that Isaac won't marry. He doesn't leave home while she's alive. So there, there there's something going on that is, in many ways, does not go on with Abraham, I don't think. 
I think that what's going on with Abraham is, first of all, there, I think that, that that quotation you used, my anger is upon you, is very um, to the point. I think there's a lot of anger there. And um, the Midrash gives a very good reason. They, they justify her statement and they say she should be angry with him. Because when he stood before God and said to God, what is any of this? What are all of these promises when Anochi Ariri, I am childless? The Midrash says, how could you say that? <laughs> how could you right. say you're childless? Why, why didn't you say we are childless? You left Sarah out. And so therefore she's now desperate. She's got to find some way in. And that's because Avram left, him, left her no but, choice. But in fact, God um, sets it up that way over and over again, promising. I mean, it, at some point he promises to Sarah, but he actually promises to Abraham at first without Sarah in the picture. Yes. And in fact, the next scene, which is one of really one of the most dramatic scenes, when Hagar is sent out mm -hmm. into the wilderness to die the first time, mm -hmm. God appears to her, or an angel appears, and promises her a multitude of children. Mm -hmm. A promise that he never makes to Sarah. To Sarah. True. And, he... and, and, and this, is part of, this is part of the slant of the, of the story that is in some ways so disturbing, is that though there is the, the laughable promise to Sarah, there's a real promise to Hagar and there's a real, and there's also the promise to, to Abraham over and over again is not through the two of you, not through Sarah, but your seed, you will be the father of many nations. Over and over again, it's, yes. it's this patriarchal promise yes. that, really, that really occludes the matriarch. And when there's finally a promise to a woman, it's, it's the to the wrong <laughs> woman. Yeah, no, but I think that it's, it's, that's part this of what needs to like get set straight, you know, is that Hagar is being told your child will, will, will be, you know, the, the father of nations and on and on and right. on, because it's Avram's seed. That promise was already made. So by default now, the child she's carrying is going to bear that destiny. But right after the Hagar incident, God then comes to Avram and clearly says, I meant her, <laughs> right? I meant Sarah. You're going to have a baby with Sarah. That's the child I meant. So it's really and this misunderstanding that I agree God had a part in. And Abraham, of course, refuses. He says, well, let Ishmael count. Why can't we just deal with, mm -hmm. we got one on the ground, let's mm -hmm. deal with that mm -hmm. one. That'll mm -hmm. work. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and God says no. No, but yeah. God doesn't come to Sarah at that point. No. He won't, he, he, and this is part of her, she really is left out. Yes, but she's left out if we look at when they are informed that they'll have a baby. Right. And the fact that that information comes to Avram first, and he laughs. Right. Right? And he laughs outwardly. Right. And then Sarah overhears the information later on. Another, he has to come again. Again, and Sarah, it's not even directed to her. She She's hears behind it, she the overhears. Tent wall. That's right, right. She, she overhears it, laughs inwardly, which I think is an important difference between the male and the female in the right. outward expression, the inward expression. But then also, God says, why is she laughing? And I think that's the crucial moment of that scene, is when God turns to Avram and says, doesn't she know this already? I told you this. Why is she laughing? Why is this a surprise to her? And again, it comes back to the trust issues. Did you not trust her enough to share this information with her? You, that's very strange. You're, you're actually you're suggesting that Abraham never told, never told never her. Told that's her why she laughed. Then why is she laughing? Of course he, he didn't. She's laughing but, because but it's the, uh, But the, the, the nature of their laughter is also different, at least the way it's traditionally explained. His laughter is joyous and uh, exalting, and hers is, is mocking. She's, this, is, this is ridiculous. Well, there, ridiculous. there is, but there is, but there is a problem. <laughs> I know that again, has a again, there's sexist a, to <laughs> again, there's a, again, there's a problem with God's role, which is then He scolds her, That's having right. never, having never oh. spoken to her directly, That's having right. never given her a promise, like He gives right. to yeah. Hagar. Right. He comes and He says, you know, you were laughing. Right. And she says, oh, no, I wasn't. He said, no, you were. Ah, and but she, how do you know afraid. that's God speaking? The text does not identify it that way. How do you know that's not Avram turning to Sarah and saying, you were laughing? And Sarah now says to Avram, no, I wasn't, because she laughed inwardly. He didn't hear it. Mm. And so again, you've got this dynamic that's going on between the two of them. And, and in terms of the laughter and, and one is mocking and one is joyous, again, I don't think the text can bear out that in a strong sense. I think what you're getting in terms of the laughter is um, 
well, as I mentioned before, that you've got the, the male projection of, of emotion or an event outward into the world and the female projection inwardly. And um, we see this several times through the Bible because we see if we take two figures uh, such as Naomi and Job, Mm -hmm. um, without diverting too much, but both of them have terrible family tragedies fall upon them. Both of them lose family members. Um, Joe projects his reaction outward into the world, and Naomi projects her reaction inward. So we're just seeing again this male-female response that is almost parallel, but because of the gender lines is not parallel. And I, I certainly wouldn't say one is joyous and one is mocking. I would just say they're different. Yeah, this is a terrible marriage counselor. God is a bad marriage counselor. That's, I can't believe the two of you are describing such a dysfunctional relationship. I want to cry. I can't believe that this is, we're talking about Abraham and Sarah here. Oh, why is it dysfunctional? Why are you seeing it as dysfunctional? No, no, no. Everything that, you know, it's, that all of these, these ideas that are coming forth suggest that this is a, you, you, a... So you think that normally parents manage to tell each other the important information that they normally really trust each other so deeply? And no, they, no, they, actually, they don't no, I, have failing. No, no, I'll actually scores? go along with you on that. I don't mind saying that they have, they have trust issues. I don't mind saying that they, they have uh, a certain inability to love for one reason or another. L what is there then? No, but what you have is. <laughs> I mean, that, that, that's, you know, that's what there isn't. Well, that's. But yeah. I don't think. Is it just. Okay. You have fine. tremendous growth. But, okay, but growth then suggests that we're growing towards love and towards all these things that we're lacking. What I'm interested in mm -hmm. is what do they have? They don't have love and they don't have this other stuff, but what do they have? There must be, they're a unique couple. There's no one like them before them. Mm -hmm. There's some kind of powerful bond between the two of them right from the beginning mm -hmm. that makes them Abraham and Sarah. I mean, they have, for one, they have a monogamy. Well, they aren't Abraham and Sarah at the beginning. Uh, okay, Abraham and Sarah. <laughs> <laughs> but they have a monog for, for one, they have a monogamous relationship, mm -hmm. right? Which mm -hmm. is, I think, unusual. Mm -hmm. But they don't because he takes Hagar. Okay, well, but at her behest. Okay. When she tells him to. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but yeah. they don't have a monogamous but relationship. You know, but let's, what, you know what? Let's look at, can we look at this from the standpoint of, of what we were talking about, of Isaac. Both of them laugh when uh, God announces that they're going to have a son and that it's going to be Isaac. And the reason that they both laugh is very simple. I'm a hundred, she's a hundred, or I'm 101, she's a hundred. What are you talking about? How, could, how is a hundred-year-old couple going to engage in marital relations and produce a child? And God says, that's that's precisely what's going to happen. That, that, the, the, the absurdity of that is precisely the point. The joke is precisely the point. And I assume mm -hmm. that that suggests that there's something very special about this conjugal act. I mean, it's a conjugal act at 100. And therefore, it's, uh, there's something special. It's a conjugal act at 100 that produces a child. And therefore, that, no, that's, that's the, the important part. part. Oh, you know, because it's in fairness to the seniors, it's not the fact that they're going to be intimate again. No, but she, that, 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 I, I, she, she says that, though. She says, no, but she, no, says, she says, my flow has stopped. The fact right, is she's okay. post... She, she's no, but she's she's she says, post I'm going to be with my husband at this age. She well, says that, right? Th look, mm. the, part of their problem is... I, it's not. And it's my not, husband is old, she says, right? That's right. So one, so would, like one would think that he couldn't then continue to be reproductive only in a sense of being able to, to produce seed, not right. in the sense of being able to be intimate. The sperm together. count is down. <laughs> <All right. laughs> so that you age. see that as the only problem. All right. But, but, that's, but you see, the, the, the interesting question is, uh, uh, you know, about what they have is they have a promise, but the, the real question that we're going at is whether they have a promise or whether Abraham has a promise, or whether Sarah is trying to be, I mean, whether her vision of a future together at this point, at this age, has now closed out. Have they both somehow lost? I mean, this is part of the reason they laugh is it's, it's like to be said, it's, it's, it's a promise that seems to be, you know, already canceled. We, you know, we missed our, that's a good idea, God, but we missed our chance. We're too old to have children now. And, so, when they were younger, of course, they had the expectation of children. Uh, but I think that's so crucial in the total picture of their relationship. What right. we have here is we have two individuals who are both trying to enter the covenant separately. Avram is entering it through all this testing that goes on between him and God. Sarah is trying to enter it through another woman's womb. She, she can't even see her way to enter it by herself. Each of them independently and separately are trying to enter this covenant. And God seems to continuously be trying to tell them, 
I mean the two of you together. He says it to them explicitly. He does it with the name change, when they change from Avram and Sarai to Avraham and Sarah, by placing the same letter in both their names, and, and the commentaries say that that letter, each hey is coming from God's name, so that essentially, look at what's being taken away from Sarai's name. She gets the Yud taken out, which was also from God's name. So essentially what's being said is you may have this separate relationship with God, as the Yud in your name indicates, but that's not good enough here. You need to have the same one that your mate has. You've the, got are to you come saying together. That, that, that besides the personal covenants that each one of them has to have with God, they also have to have a covenant between them. Absolutely. Yeah. And they must share this spiritual journey together or it will rip them apart. And we've seen that it almost rips them apart. What are they and held that's by the if not child. a covenant? That's the child. Is that when God comes to them when they're old, ultimately saying to them, now you're ready. Because to produce the child, you must come together. You have to unite in this way that is the ultimate union between the two of you that will produce this other being that's a covenantal being. That's the beauty of the child. And that's the final lesson to them as, as a couple, is to say, as long as you pull and push at each other separately this way, you can't produce this child. You can't mm -hmm. come together into covenant. What is a covenant here that you're talking about? I mean, what, what exactly is it a unity of vision? Because that, that's not necessarily a covenant. No, it's, it's the, mutual, um, the mutual contract that is beginning here between uh, this family and the descendants of this family and the divine creator of the universe. No, no, but I mean the, the, the covenant between Abraham and Sarah. What, what is that covenant supposed to be? Is uh, that a unity of vision? Well, is that I what says, God would no, like I, I think them? I think that's the problem, is that even around the child, they don't quite see eye to eye. I no. Mean, and, Do they and, ever see eye to eye? Well, that's, that's, what I'm, that's Do, my point. Oh, is that they, I, they, I, don't, I think that, that, that through the child, they each come into relationship with God um, in a way that they couldn't without the child. Mm -hmm. But they, they are both still stuck, uh, in some ways, at a tremendous distance from each other. I would agree, and I think that what we have, and we also have to bear in mind this is just the first generation, right. but what we also see is we see that, as, as you pointed out, you have covenant between the couple and God and covenant between the couple and each other, and it seems like as long as it's one or the other, they'll manage, but the minute they try to bring everything into one picture, every time God enters their marriage, and with covenant, God is pretty much almost entering their marital bed by saying, you'll have a baby now, you won't have the baby then. It's disastrous. It's, it's, it's such a struggle. It's such a push and pull. And it's so real. Um, it's difficult enough for two human beings to have a marriage and go through life together day to day and now include this infinite being into it and the struggle just increases by a hundredfold. And so it's a, it's a very realistic picture that we're being given. But what's important is that there is change and there's tremendous growth. Um, even when we look at the incident with Paro and with Avimelech that we began talking about, the second time is very different. The second time God doesn't let Avram get away with it. God says to Avimelech, you go and have Avram pray on your behalf because he's a Navi, and a Navi in this context means spokesperson. So essentially, God is setting Avram up to plead Avimelech's case, which really puts him in Avimelech's shoes. Hmm. And it's the last time Avram ever does this because he finally learns what it means to be on the receiving end of this kind of deceit. Hmm. So there's a lot of growth and a lot of change, a lot of moving together. But ultimately, I agree, they're ripped apart. At the end of their lives, after the Akedah, all human relationships are just completely severed. Do there. they ever achieve a covenantal situation? Is, or is, is Isaac the covenant somehow, the embodiment of the covenant between them? Yes. yes to me, but Isaac is their achievement of their covenantal moment. I don't think that they, they ever, beyond Isaac, they're ever able to... Um, to, to reach that kind of, of uh, um, joining or unity. So they peak with Isaac and then decline again. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that it was very hard to get Isaac and it was very hard to keep Isaac. And um, I think that when you think about their relationship, you see it as a very um, fragile and, uh, and difficult um, relationship. 
throughout. And the, the fragility or the, the, the sense in which it's on the edge um, is in fact part of what the narrative is telling us over and over again. They, though Sarah doesn't have a lot of lines in this, her, the, their dialogues are very difficult. They, ha they, they quarrel, they disagree, they, have, you know, they really are struck with problem after problem in their relationship before they get Isaac and then afterwards they, they can't even speak to each other. You know, when I, when I think of Sarah, I, um, I actually think of my grandmother. <laughs> I do, and, and that's, why, that's why I really would like to know, uh, to, to, we talked about this during the, the break, what is it exactly that keeps these people together, this couple together from the beginning? Granted, at the end of a long life, they come to a certain covenantal situation, a, a covenantal realization, where they see each other and say, oh, now we know what love is, if if it's love, Some, there's something there. But the whole time, there's something else there. You know, what is it that's holding them together? I think there's, there's a tremendous amount of dignity. I think there's a tremendous mm. amount of honor. I think it's important that the word love is not in the text when talking about the two of them, because it's really saying to the reader, here's another kind of bonding between two people. It's not the passionate love uh, of, of Jacob and Rachel for each other. It's not the physical chemistry of, of Isaac and Rebecca. It's dignity, it's honor, it's respect. This, is, this will hold two people together. And after all, it's, it's the first one. I mean, yes. history could have begun with the love of, of with Isaac falling in love with Rebecca yes. or Rachel and, and Jacob, but it didn't. It began with this type of relationship, yes. a relationship that's dignified. Yes, absolutely. I think it's very important. I think it also, I mean, the fact that they, they are torn apart toward the end of their lives, and they are, um, but I don't think that that can negate what they went through while they were together, and all the trials and tribulations and how they did try to resolve it, um, that, that they, they were trying to, to, to conquer this challenge of being so independent. Um, and, and how do you pull together? And again, we can't forget this is the first generation. It's such a new, innovative concept to have two people function together um, in, in a spiritual journey as opposed to each on their own. It's definitely a struggle. Um, but I, I, I really do see a beautiful relationship between these two of dignity and, and honor. Um, I wonder how it began. Yes, we're not told <laughs> anything. We don't know. It's, it's anything. be interesting. I mean, why yeah. is it that all of a sudden uh, there's this rupture in history, uh, where suddenly th there's this couple that's very dignified and they? Well, I, I don't. I don't think that the rup I think the rupture happens after the wedding. I mean, mm -hmm. it, 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 in after the story, their wedding. After their wedding, sure, because lech lecha is the rupture. That is, the the call for a relationship with God. God's demand upon Abraham and his promise happens after they are already a couple. And it's one of the things that disturbs me very much about that moment. What? I, I, explain it. Well, I, I'm in, not sure. in the, in the they are, Sarah, they're already married in chapter 11. That's right. Before, and Sarah is barren before, 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 before they Abraham cross is the sent river out. and go mm -hmm. into the land of Canaan. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Before Abraham is sent out. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's, part of the way that, that God relates to the two of them is that it's to Abraham mm -hmm. um, and the, the imperative is in Certainly the singular. Sarah doesn't lack a sense of mission. I would no. Think. I, I mean, she I, could have said go. No, I'm she saying. doesn't. <laughs> right? I mean, she, it, no, that's sort she, of what happens well, in, in Lot's family. situation. Not, right. not granted, not with his, well, even right. with his wife. When, even with his when wife, Lot, she stays. Yeah, with Lot, yeah. she, yeah. she yeah. stays. She turns. Yeah. Right. She turns to stay. Around. She and with Lot's son-in-law, son you know, when he says when he says to his sons-in-law, he says, come with me, and they start laughing at him. But what Sarah doesn't, I mean, she does laugh at Abraham, but she follows him. Or does she even follow him? Well, that's Somehow she seems to be in tune with his sense of mission. Well, that, uh, that's my point. It's, it's interesting that, you know, precisely, you know, Lot's wife we hear about when it's time to go, and Abraham's wife we don't hear about here at yeah, all. Yeah, but we have start. to also just, we have to take the broader view, pull back a little bit and take the broader view. The text makes quite an issue of their names later on. Right. And again, the Midrash picks up on this, and I think quite rightly and beautifully, that Sarai has a Yud in her name. She already has a relationship with God. Before Avram does, before Lech Lecha, before any of this is going on, she already has that relationship. The struggle now is for her to somehow find the relationship with Avram, with God. That's her struggle. Whereas Avram's has his own What's trust issues. Back? What's holding her back? I mean, they, they each seem to have something holding them back from trusting. 
it's not necessarily the same thing in both of them. What's yeah. holding her back? And I'm what's not sure him that back? she's got an issue of trust. Yeah. There's, there's one midrash where after she's taken into the harem, um, it says that she's um, arguing with God all night long. She's turning angry with God, and she's saying, and to paraphrase the midrash, she's saying, let me get this clear here. I work on faith with you. He works testing you. He's out there safe, and I'm the one in here in the harem all the time. <laughs> and, and God answers her in the Midrash and says, Sarah, you're right. Everything I do, I do for you. And so Sarah's issues are not trust issues. They're fairness issues. It's where she's turning to God and saying, explain this. I don't understand what's going on. I don't see the fairness here. And in this Midrash, God is agreeing with her that it was unfair, and then saying, from now on, I will try to correct it. I'll keep an eye on that. But it's important in, in oh, the relationship. Yes. Okay, well, let's, uh, then let's ask yes. the question. What effect on the relationship did the, the potential sacrifice of Isaac have on the relationship? What were the reverberations? On Abraham and Sarah's relationship? On uh, Abraham and Sarah's relationship. Killed it. That's the end. Yeah. So God killed, kill, God killed the relationship. God, who's been all along saying, look, the two of you have to get it together. I know, you tr I know we have a covenant individually, but you, the two of you have to have a covenant together. Mm -hmm. And finally, when they're on, they, they're on the verge, or not on the verge, they achieve the covenant together with Isaac, God steps back into the scene mm -hmm. and says, nah, 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 nah. What, 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 what should I mean, have, what, what goes what, on? Why, why does God, <laughs> why, is, why does God stir up trouble after having, what's the point? Oh, it seems I think rather sadistic. God, God still has... Um, this, these, these issues to work out with Avram, there still is, is miles to travel uh, for Avram to go and, and the, the Akedah is taking place quite literally between God and Avram and Sarah, it, Sarah has no part there and the silence of her in the text is as important as when we hear her voice in other places. That This has nothing to do with her and I think that's why it breaks their relationship is because as a mother, when she hears about it, and one Midrash says that she dies immediately when she hears about it. Uh, another Midrash says that when she hears about it, she leaves him. She doesn't want to see him anymore. She takes Isaac and goes and separates and doesn't see him again until she dies. Um, that, that is, is it, is she, it a, a, a problem of, of uh, the men and God as masculine, at least, somehow leaving out a woman's feelings? I think it's an ego issue. I think when you have God and Avram walking up that mountain, what you have is you have two egos walking up trying to resolve this, where God is ultimately saying to Avram, can you subordinate your ego to me? Because if you cannot, this can't proceed. And it's the, the test of all tests. And I, I see Sarah as a mother out of the picture when she hears about it, so horrified, so angry, so upset. In, in virtually feeling inside that, you know, you couldn't resolve your issues, so you took my child and you, you used my child as the tool to resolve the, the ego issues. It's just, but that's strange because you, uh, you, you said also that, that God um, is trying to educate the two of them away from ego, their ego issues. God is the one who says that you have to have a covenant precisely because you're, each, each one of you hasn't yet let go of your ego properly, which is per perhaps what is required in a covenant. Uh, but I wouldn't say it's letting Suddenly go Suddenly God has an ego? ego? No. Yeah, no, I wouldn't say it's letting go serving. of your ego. It's yes. being willing to serve God. Yes, being willing to serve God. No, and Sarah, no, 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 no. You're talking about serving each other, right? I mean, there's a covenant between Abraham and Sarah, and God is saying, but you may serve me, but you, haven't, you don't serve each other yet. But even that's not service. a, yes, but even that's not a, a sense of letting go so much as it is a sense of, of, of making room for each other. But in, in this way, it, it's just that... The issues are, there is no room for Sarah in these issues. And this is the, and this is the, I mean, this is the problem. This is the narrative of Abraham's, I mean, the test does make Abraham in one sense. It makes him, um, it makes, because he was willing, um, you know, that's the scoot. He, he finally got to the point of trusting God, mm -hmm. which, which was almost an un, you know, an unachievable goal. It mm -hmm. was very... It was touch and go, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but it it happens at the expense of completely excluding Sarah, Sarah. And, and and his and, child and and Isaac. I mean, because yeah. because it, you know there are the stories that she died the moment she heard about it. Of mm -hmm. course, there are other midrashim that, of course, he actually killed Isaac. That's right. That's right. And and in some deep sense, he obviously, when Isaac says my father and he says my son, and he can't tell him what's going on. He, he doesn't say anything to Sarah, but faced with a, in a face-to-face -face confrontation, he can't tell his son. Mm -hmm. 
he, he's lost it. But even more than that, there's another Midrash that says he lies to Sarah. He comes to Sarah in the morning and says, I have to take the child and send him to school. He's old enough now, he has to go to school. He's lying to her. Right. And when you realize this is a test, the, the text tells you that, maybe God's testing again. Does he trust her? Is he sharing information with her? Or is he doing what he was doing before? Is he, is he concocting these, these stories and not giving her the truth, not bringing her in, not, not, right. not facing this together? It's again the test. And I, can I, I can, sense uh, sorry, I, I, I want to, I, I, I like this issue, but I, I, we don't have much time left, and I do want to get to the, to the final issue, which mm -hmm. is uh, that of the burial of Sarah. Right. Um, I hope that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> uh, she's buried uh, in the cave of Machpelah, which Abraham buys uh, in order to bury her. And, I, and my question is, what does this whole incident mean in, uh, retroactively, at least about the relationship? Well, I think that the... Um Maybe you can tell us what the, the, give us a brief synopsis of what actually goes on. Well, she dies, and he has to come back from where he's been, and he mourns her. And of course, the other person who mourns her is Isaac. And Isaac's grief is really unquenchable grief mm -hmm. until Rebecca comes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it, their relationship, is, the contrast is quite stark, because, uh, because uh, Isaac, as the son, has not been married, has in, obviously been very close with her and, and grieves as a child would, but of course a, a husband could grieve also in a much more dramatic sense or a much more profound emotional sense. Um, Abraham will shortly after he gets Isaac matched up, will marry again and have more children. And, you know, life continues and there are lots of more children. So the, if Abraham moves on, but before he can move on, he has to bury her, and it's a very complicated negotiation with the locals to get this cave, um, which is the source of a lot of midrash and, and, mm -hmm. and interpretation. But I, th that negotiation itself isn't so interesting as this sense of needing a place for burial. And it's going to be his grave as well. Yes. And it's going to become the family grave. It is the one place. The promise to Abraham is not just children. It's also the land. Yes, and this is and the, that's important. And this is the postage stamp size of piece of land that they get. But the, what's beautiful about it, to be honest, is because it is, we're losing Sarah there. We lose the first matriarch. And what we see with the, this cave of Machpelah and where she's buried is we're, we're starting to see resolution to all of these issues, some of it coming too late. We, we hear the, the, the rabbis tell us that the eulogy that Avram gives Sarah um, is, is a beautiful one on, on a woman of valor. And, and you hear all of that and you realize, you know, the tragedy of this beautiful eulogy is that he's saying it all about her and he's not said it to her. And, and so he, he does have recognition of her value, but maybe gets it just a little bit too late, is able to verbalize it just a little bit too late. But what we see with her being buried in this very first piece of land owned by a Jew, which is be the beginning of the resolution of that covenantal promise, mm -hmm. is that she is the first person buried in the very first piece of land of Israel owned by a Jewish person. And what you get with her being buried there is ultimately now for the first time you get a total merging of land land and body. You get the body of the matriarch being placed into the land, um, deep in the earth, which is again this very um, natural image of, of bringing the body back to the earth. Eventually her body will become part of that earth, inseparable. You wouldn't be able to tell what's the land of Israel and what's the body of the matriarch. And so ultimately all the struggles that Sarah had coming into the covenant, as we said, it was seemed to be aimed at Avram. She had all these struggles getting in through a side door. There was all that misunderstanding. But here, in this very first piece of land that's owned, she is the one that will meld with this land. She is the one that will merge with it. So she is seeing the, the, the um, fulfillment of covenant in a much more uh, real, deep, essential way than Avram will until the moment that he dies. But she's the first one. And it's, it's beautiful beginning of resolution, because again, they're the first generation. So we just see the beginnings of everything going on with them. Mm. Uh, well, mm. any uh, well, any last thoughts? If not, if not on this one issue, we have a couple of minutes. Uh, well, about three I, minutes left. You about a minute each. I I have a, a, a slightly different sense of the grief at her. Mm. Uh, I I think that 
that um, that at this at this stage in the story, um, a grave is the best in some ways that people can do, the best that God can do with the people. It's the it's 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 the strongest statement of the relationship between the people and God is a grave, and um, this grave recurs throughout Genesis. It's a very important grave. Mm -hmm. It's very important. And the idea of burial is very important. The very end of Genesis ends with dragging Joseph's bones out of Egypt. The, the By the promise. way, I, I like the fact that you're using the word grave as a, as a pun, but not just a pun on, on the gravity right. that we've been seeing in the relationship between these two people. But I, I think that, that it's it's, it's a dead a, serious it's a, it's a very it's, it's a very serious relationship <laughs> but I think it's it's really um, it, it will take development throughout the relationship this is only the beginning of the story and in some ways I think this is the story be, in, in many ways the story begins in the grave and it has to rise from there mm. um, and the Isaac the story of Isaac as the promise of new children of, of the lineage in some sense is almost swallow. I mean, he, he of course survives the Akedah and he has children and, they, but at this point in the narrative, his grief reflects also the, and not, not the absolute failure, but the, the gravity and the sorrow in this, in the stage of the relationship of the people and God as well. Mm -hmm. um, can I get some yeah. last uh, words? Yeah. We really, we have one minute left, so if you could give me a... Something less, grave, uh, something, something less grave, maybe. Something less grave. And on a, on a light note. <laughs> okay. um, I think that when we look at Avram and Sarah and we look at their relationship, the, the thing that I find the most beautiful and moving about that relationship is how real it is. There are wonderful positive things there. There are challenges there. There is conflict there. There's anger. There's emotion. It's incredibly real. I want to thank both of you very much for this delicious conversation. I don't even need dessert. <laughs> Gravity is, of course, the force that pulls you down. It's the force that makes you serious. There's so much levity around, it's hard to know why we should be grave. And yet Abraham and Sarah suggest that that's the foundation of everything. A little bit of seriousness, which is interesting, actually, because their son, of course, is named Isaac. Laughter. Is it the kind of laughter that is the opposite of gravity? Or is it a laughter that bursts precisely out of the depth and out of the heart of gravity itself? I hope you enjoyed this show. I certainly did. Please join me next week as we delve into the grave depths of the Torah and perhaps surface with a smile. Blessings and peace. Passages or stretches of text in scripture, as short as one verse or as long as a number of chapters. Passages are stories that teach, but passages are also what these verses and teachings must pass through, passageways, in order to be heard and learned by us. Sarah, do you love me?